Euromax highlights. Coming up on the show... Porcelain Pride. European Porcelain celebrates its 300th anniversary. Classic cars. The BMW 328 Milli Milia is a gem for vintage car fans. Finest fare. The Noma in Copenhagen has been named the world's best restaurant. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Karen Helmstedt. Hi there and welcome to our Highlights edition. Well, for centuries or even millennia, winemaking has largely been considered to be a man's domain. And even the Association of German Prädikat Wine Estates has long been more or less a boys' club for most of its existence. But lo and behold, this year, as it celebrates its 100th anniversary, 13 female vintners are included in its ranks. And according to experts, that number is on the rise. Well, Euromax met up with two of them to see how their combination of palate, passion and imagination is winning over the industry. Riding through vineyards on a motorcycle, Eva Fulmer likes to be unconventional. Born in Mainz 28 years ago, she took just two years to become one of Germany's most successful woman winemakers. The Go Mio Wine Guide has dubbed her its 2010 Discovery of the Year, the first time a woman has held the title. Women put more emotion into it. This is a very new wine-growing estate, so I've got nothing to lose. I can do things the way I want, whether it's marketing or bottling or the style of the wine itself. There's a lot of Eva Folma in each bottle. Her family has owned the vineyards for a long time, but until two years ago, they still gave their grapes to a growers' cooperative. Eva Folma changed that. In 2008, she produced her first wine with great success. Her secret? Female intuition. Is this wine the way I had imagined it? Does it need more time to mature? Can I bottle it now or can I wait? It's a bit like having a small child in the wine cellar whose development you're trying to monitor and control. Eva set up her wine cellar on her parents' farm. It's small but modern. She says you don't always need a long-standing tradition to make good wine. I'm quite satisfied with this wine here, a Silvana selection. It can take a bit of still maturing in casks, and then it'll be bottled in September. Even though her parents weren't vintners, Eva Vollmer was interested in winemaking early on. In 2003, as Rheinhessen Wine Queen, she promoted the region's top wines. Now she's producing wine herself. With training in wine production, a diploma, and soon a doctorate, Eva has secured her place in what was once a domain dominated by men. In a blind tasting, you couldn't tell the difference between a man's wine and a woman's wine. But the decision-making process is slightly different. I think women decide much more emotionally. At least, I noticed that in my own case. 50 kilometers away, Langenlohnsheim in the Naha Valley. This is where Annette Klosheim produces premium German wines. The 32-year-old comes from a traditional winemaking family and thinks the success of young women makes sense. For one thing, women are very ambitious. They have sensitive palates and a good sense of smell. It's been scientifically proven that women are better wine tasters and those are prerequisites for making good wine later on. On her parents' 150-year-old estate, Annette Klosheim learned a lot about professional winemaking. Later, she studied the wine business in London, among other places. Then she took over a part of her father's vineyards. He didn't immediately fling his arms around my neck. At first he was very skeptical and kept a critical eye on what was going on in the vineyards. But with my first success, winning the Riesling Discovery of the Year organized by a large magazine, he was a very proud father indeed. Annette Klosheim wants to reach new target groups with her wines, for instance, young people who are intimidated by the knowledge of wine connoisseurs. So, in tastings, she avoids the abstract jargon used by aficionados. 
Also ich versuche einfach Genuss. I just try to point out opportunities for enjoying wine. I give them recipes to go with the wine, for example. Those are just small aspects in which I go my own way. Or take labeling. Mine is definitely more modern, lighthearted and livelier in order to attract young people in particular. Two women, two concepts and one all-consuming passion. With unconventional methods, Annette Klosheim and Eva Vollmer are both working on their next premium wine. Well, it was definitely more suited to tea and used to be referred to as white gold. Fine porcelain. And anyone who's lucky enough to inherit their grandmother's good china service does know how valuable it can be. Well, the year 2010 marks the 300th anniversary of the reproduction of hard porcelain here in Europe. And for the occasion, this continent's largest porcelain museum, the Porcelanicon in Selp and Hohenberg in northeastern Bavaria, is holding a stunning exhibition. It radiates an aura of exclusivity, whether as historical table settings or a modern work of art. Porcelain has lent class to everything for centuries. Now for its 300th anniversary, its history is being presented at an exhibition in the Bavarian town of Zelb. Julia Rolf, an art historian and expert on porcelain, helped conceive Europe's biggest porcelain exhibition ever, entitled From a King's Dream to Mass Production. Porcelain was originally ordered by kings and princes, and later it was also made in Europe. It was reserved for the nobility. Europe's first hard paste porcelain was invented in 1710 at the court of Saxony. The alchemist Johann Friedrich Böttger had been jailed for claiming he could turn base materials into gold. Then, experimenting with quartz and other minerals, he discovered how to reproduce the white gold previously known only from China. Now porcelain no longer had to be imported. Since then, the high-class material has reflected the trends and fashions of different eras. In the 18th century, the Rococo period, we see verve and cheerfulness in dancer figures painted in bright pastel colors. In contrast, during the Napoleonic era, porcelain had ornate painting, lots of gold, the kind of decoration the emperor liked. The French ruler's personal dinner plates from the 19th century are on display at the exhibition, along with the porcelain of the Medici dynasty. These are unique objects worth millions. There's a mysterious story associated with this service. It was on a ship crossing the Baltic Sea to Russia to the court of Catherine the Great. But the ship sank in 1747. More than 250 years later, the sunken ship was found by chance. The porcelain was recovered in fantastic condition. It had been covered in moss and slumbered undisturbed on the seabed. Today, designers prize porcelain as an innovative material. It looks very fragile, but is actually rather robust. The architect and designer Marcello Morandini was one of the first to use it extensively in his work. He makes sculptured room dividers and organic-looking storage shelves. There simply aren't any limitations with porcelain not in the language of its shape, nor technically. You can form anything out of it, change its transparency, and decorate it from the outside as you like. And it lends itself to being combined with other materials. This versatility has always fascinated artists. Here's a porcelain painting by Andy Warhol. Here, an original by Roy Lichtenstein in the form of a cup. And here, an ironic self-portrait by Cindy Sherman. Artists have often investigated the possibilities of porcelain. Like Franck Bragigan, the Frenchman created a room installation especially for this exhibition. He recombined porcelain pieces slated for the waste bin. Imperfect products become works of art. The beauty in Europe is about perfection, is about 
a balance, equilibrium, and high quality uh, handcraft work. In Japan, it's a bit different. It's the mistake which makes things um, very precious. Uh, by making everything perfect, you want that mass production is always looking the same. And I'm doing the opposite. That means every object is now totally unique. Porcelain is a barometer of its time, a material with one foot in tradition and another in modernity. And it's been so in Europe for 300 years. And a real thrill for lovers of vintage cars this past week was the annual Concorso d'Eleganza on Lake Como in northern Italy. It's one of the most significant events to celebrate the mystique of classic automobiles, held for the first time back in 1929. This gathering focuses on authentic design and atmosphere, as well as perfect restoration of the cars. And it brings together the most exquisite autos in the world, including an extra special treat this year. 50 of the most beautiful and expensive classic cars of the last century are on display in the park of traditional hotel Villa d'Este on Lake Como. Many car lovers make the pilgrimage to the Concorso d'Eleganza each year and are tough to impress. But the BMW 328 makes almost everyone gush. Built in 1939 for the Mille Miglia car race, the vehicle attracts the attention of vintage car collectors, designers, and architects. Even Formula One world champions are awed. It's uh, uh, outstanding, and uh, it's incredibly modern, too, for it. So it's a very, very, very uh, innovative car. Look at this and feel the emotion. You know, you, you feel the design, you believe the design. The minute you see it, it starts to run through your eyes, drives right down into your chest, and you're just like, wow. I mean, it really was a, a revolution of its time with streamlining, because even in the Mille Miglia of that year, there were more cars with, uh, with less aerodynamics than this. In 1940, the Roadster placed sixth in the Mille Miglia race. It's due to the dedication of German restorer Tom Fischer that the BMW 328 can still go at all. He's rebuilt the car so that its 130 horsepower engine can still reach a top speed of 200 kilometers per hour. You can understand how you can get into the spirit. One look over the hood and you can imagine what the guys felt back then. The BMW 328 is a streamlined roadster. A decade ago, its owner, who wishes to remain anonymous, gave the car to Tom Fisher to restore. BMW's race car division developed the vehicle solely to compete in the Mille Miglia race. It's the only remaining one now, and has a few idiosyncrasies. Naturally, the vehicle was all built by hand. So there are slight differences between the left and right headlights, so the vehicle looks a bit cross-eyed. But just as no one would change the Mona Lisa to make her look better, we restored her to look just the way she always did. That's the greatest goal of a restoration, which really lives up to its name. Fisher spent two years pouring through archives before restoring the car. Back in the 1930s, designer Wilhelm Kaiser and his constructors did something most thought impossible. They built an ultra-light car. It weighs just 725 kilograms. The car is a symbol of passion, innovation, all the points that really go to make up what a car should be. After the war, the vehicle ended up in the Soviet Union. Even the son of Stalin drove it for a while. In 2001, the current owner bought it in Latvia. Back at the Concorso d'Eleganza in Italy, the jury is impressed by the restored BMW. Just giving an, an overview. Everything said, uh, I'm, an, I'm an old car with a, with a very strange story on my back. The car is in an incredible original condition. If you think how many cars are restored to death, I believe it's the biggest charm of this car that you can see how people built cars back in those days. 
It's hardly surprising that the BMW 328 Mille Miglia ultimately wins the first prize in the category of pre-war race cars. This just shows how fascinating this car is. The public has proved it again. The jury as well. It's full of prominent people, and it has recognized the value of this vehicle. The prize comes at a good time. After the award ceremony, Tom Fisher is heading to Monaco, where the car is due to be auctioned off on May 1st. Experts are expecting it to fetch up to 15 million euros. That would make it the most expensive BMW ever. Great old stuff. But now it's right back to the 21st century. It was just four years ago that the Japanese video game company Nintendo came out with its famous Wii. That's a game console that requires full body motion to make it work. Well, the Wii was wildly successful in the US, hauling as it did a sedentary computer generation out of its chairs and putting real movement into interactive games. Hardly surprising then that the fitness industry has picked up on this entertaining way to get your heart rate up. And here in Germany, some researchers are even convinced that computer games will soon be an integral part of our fitness regimens. Well, we looked into it. This futuristic looking venue in the heart of Berlin is a cross between a bar and a computer game lounge. Things can get pretty energetic inside, at least in a virtual kind of way. It's not like real sport, but you do get exercise. It can get energetic. If you're boxing, you're getting a proper workout. Compared to a normal bar, the guests probably are more physical. It's a place where people come to hang out and play computer games together. And the crowd often works up quite a sweat. People do get sweaty, you can tell by how many drinks they order and by what people tell us. They say they've had bad muscle aches the day after they were here. So have computer games become as effective as regular sports? Britta Oertel from the Institute for Future Studies is an expert on German's leisure activities. She says the advantage of playing computer games is a way of getting some exercise without having to try too hard. When you're caught up in a computer game, then you have the advantage that you're not really aware you're making any kind of physical effort. Instead, you're distracted by the multimedia and you're concentrating, and maybe therefore you have more fun doing it. Michael Jon develops sports options in the virtual world. He and his interdisciplinary team work in a test center in Duisburg, exploring how computer simulations can affect motivation. The point of the study was to evaluate how synthetic content and real content affect motivation. State-of-the-art projection technology provides users with a realistic environment. This virtual cycling experience is designed to make it feel as realistic as possible. Uwe Nixdorf watches the test subjects carefully. We all know that if we're cycling through the Alps, we feel more motivated than we do cycling towards a bare wall. The data he gathers should reveal interesting information on motivation in artificial training conditions. Ulrich Jericho is coordinating the data, and he'll be the one who evaluates it. Subjectively, you can already say that the test subjects definitely feel as though they're performing better when they're using virtual reality. It would be great with a cyclist in front of me, then I could try and catch up. Sensors monitor breathing, and the technology can regulate how much oxygen the players get. Reducing oxygen recreates high-altitude training, which over the long haul improves conditioning by forcing one to work harder. Increasing the oxygen supply brings immediate improvements. That allows them to achieve the same effect in half the time as in normal conditions. Sensory stimulation is also used to improve motivation. Test subjects can enjoy virtual images, music and various fragrances while working out. The more senses that are stimulated, the more the test subject becomes immersed in a virtual reality. The images help you forget your surroundings and lose yourself in this parallel world. 
training in a parallel world instead of a boring old gym could be the future of sports if it's up to Yericho's research team. They predict that the border between sports and relaxation will soon start to blur. The market is ready for virtual reality. This could be installed in any sport or physiotherapy center. The main clients could be first fitness centers, then physiotherapy practices, and then just regular customers. Monitors will be playing an ever greater role in sports in the future. Judging by the participants, virtual fitness looks like a lot of fun. And finally, how about a little dinner in Copenhagen at the newly decorated World's Best Restaurant? Once a year, the London-based restaurant magazine releases its list of the world's top 50 restaurants, and this time there was a changing of the guard. For the past four years, Spanish chef Ferran Adria took top accolades for his molecular magic at his restaurant El Bulli on the Costa Brava. But this year, he had to step aside for a young man and his team from the Noma. Euromax reports. The Nerve Center of International Cuisine can be found here in a former warehouse by Copenhagen's waterfront. Noma's Kitchen is run by Danish chef René Redzepi, who has made quite a name for himself in recent years with his brand of avant-garde Scandinavian cooking. On Monday this week, the 32-year-old chef and his team accepted the award for the best restaurant in the world. Best restaurant. René, the floor is yours. Well, we started seven years ago, more or less. I think none of us did we ever think this, guys. Did we ever imagine that we could take it so far? The Danish restaurant marks a new departure from the conventions of international gourmet cuisine and a return to local traditions. René Redzepi draws his inspiration from the region, reworking traditional Danish recipes with ultra-modern approaches to cooking. Take this dish of potatoes garnished with edible soil made of malt, hazelnuts and beer. A lot of restaurants talk about um, local seasonal food, local seasonal ingredients, and, and Noma takes that to the uh, extreme levels um, with its foraging and its picking of wild plants and herbs. Um, and it's all about reconnecting the customer or the diner with nature and with the source of your food. And it doesn't do it in a worthy way, it does it with a lot of fun. El Bully had ruled the list for four years. The restaurant, run by Spanish chef Ferran Adria, has now been knocked off the top spot, but is still a respectable number two. And as an early adopter of molecular cooking, Adria is being awarded the Chef of the Decade title. However, this year, the experts feel that molecular cooking is no longer where the action is. After a few years, things tend to get established and start to look a bit tired. And everyone starts to wonder what the next step will be, in which direction is international cuisine headed. And right now, the signs are that the most exciting developments are in Scandinavia. The international gourmet community gathered in London to celebrate the new best restaurant list. The jury consisted of more than 800 master chefs, journalists and food experts. They assess restaurants all over the world, from the US to the classic fine dining countries such as France. What they consider when compiling the list are factors such as which restaurants are people talking about, where are the really pioneering chefs, who's interesting, who will still be surprising us in 10 years' time. It's not necessarily a list of the best restaurants, but the most interesting ones. Agua in Wolfsburg is the wild card on the list, a new entry at number 34. Chef Sven Elferfeld is part of a new generation of cooks changing the face of German cuisine. Likewise, in the top 50, Eckhard Witzigmann, who's part of the old guard. He's being honoured this year for a lifetime achievement. French chef Alain Ducasse is also on the list, but he's one of the few French chefs who are, perhaps because they're supposedly not innovative enough for the jurors. The old guard is getting pushed out a little bit by the new guard. I also think there's a big trend towards informality, informal restaurants, which has been accelerated by the recession, I think. 
Um, so we're seeing more restaurants without fancy chandeliers and linen tablecloths and silverware, but with just wooden tables, a bit more earthy, a bit more raw, but where the food and the ingredients are the stars. And that seems to be the case at Noma in Copenhagen. Scandinavian cuisine is now the new buzzword. They'll be comma. And before we go, a quick reminder that you can find our Euromax highlights for review on YouTube. And with that, it's time for me to sign off. So until next time, all the best from us here in Berlin and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.